So without further ado, welcome Jeff. Thank you. Very excited to be here with you today. I wish I could see all of you, but it sounds like it's a lot of people. It's nice to connect across the water with those of you in the UK. I have loved the time that I've spent there and have had just a fabulous experience with so many people, uh, very skilled, brilliant professionals in the publication of Cured and um, have become enchanted by beautiful London and the countryside. So I'm very happy to speak with you today. I'm gonna to start with some slides and then we'll move away from slides and uh, talk more personally. So let's try and see how this goes and bear with me here. Um, we've had some great people working with uh, the technology around all this. So um, again, for what, um, what we're gonna talk about today is the research that I've been doing for the past 17 years. For 17 years now, I have been gathering medical evidence for people who have recovered from incurable illnesses. And it's a long story about how I got started in that. In 2002, an oncology nurse at Mass General Hospital in Boston came to me and said that she had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. She wanted help uh, relaying this information to her son, which of course was a very difficult conversation. She then went to a healing center and began calling me saying that she was seeing some amazing healings and recoveries and she hoped I would look into it. I had just graduated from the residency at Harvard and I was a new young medical director and faculty member and I didn't think anything likely was going on and I told her so and so I said no. But Nikki was persistent. She began having other people call me from around the country and elsewhere saying they had medical evidence for their recoveries. Did I want to uh, hear their stories? And I said, no. <laughs> I was also concerned about what my colleagues would think and I, I was skeptical. But as people began sending me uh, their medical files and these long handwritten or typewritten uh, copies of their stories, um, most of the stories I couldn't, I couldn't ascribe the recovery to anything that isn't known, but there were some stories that had medical evidence that did stick out for me because there was no good explanation for how they got better. And so I did eventually decide to look into it. And the past 17 years has been a long professional and personal journey into the heart of healing and well-being and what really helps us come alive and find that kind of path. And it's uh, changed me in a lot of ways. I have a different mind and body than I had 17 years ago myself. Um, and you can see that from the photos just even of me. Um, so I've been listening to stories since 2003. And there was three criteria that I followed very closely in the research that I did. I told people I wouldn't even look at their stories if they didn't have these three criteria the first criteria was they had to have a genuinely incurable illness according to all that we can really understand. Number two, they had to have medically indisputable evidence for accurate diagnosis and clear evidence for recovery. And number three, there had to be no complicating factors, no other reason to explain how they could have gotten better. There couldn't be an experimental medication they had taken or something else uh, that could potentially be an explanation. So what did I learn? I've learned a lot of things along the way. One of the things I've learned is that there's nothing spontaneous about spontaneous remission. These people all made major changes in their lives and it's just that no one had asked. Uh, it's outside of our paradigm, so we just don't see or understand these things. These, uh, we were taught in medical school that spontaneous remission is rare. It's not, it's a lot more common than we think. It's just that these stories don't really have a voice because we don't understand them and so we don't pay much attention to them. Um, common sense suggests that we should be looking at these ultimate performers in health, that perhaps they have something to teach us. I feel very privileged to be able to play a role in helping to chart this unmapped wilderness. Perhaps I should say one thing here. Uh, if you're on the science side, you call these, these kinds of events, spontaneous remission, and you're taught that these are flukes with no medical or scientific value. If you are on the spiritual or religious side, you call these miracles or spiritual healing. Um, scientists sometimes talk about these events as placebo. Uh, I think what's true is all of these terms are black boxes and we use these terms, but we've never used the tools of science to unpack what's really going on 
in, in terms of mechanisms for these terms. And science is brilliant at unpacking mechanisms, figuring out what flight is, for example, and taking the, the flight of a bird and beginning to understand the principles associated with that, such as the Bernoulli principle and creating planes that fly. In this situation, we need to use the tools of a rigorous science to unpack these terms and look at what the mechanisms are. I uh, will go briefly over the outline with you here. Uh, we'll look briefly at the current state of Western medicine, particularly in regards to chronic and lifestyle illnesses. We'll talk about the disease model and the future of the less deficit-based models. This is a very exciting time where over the course of the next 10 and 20 years, and even over the next five years, we're going to see dramatic changes in medicine, I believe, as we start to uh, be able to turn towards and study healing and well-being and where one can still keep their career in great academic institutions and still do that. Uh, the future is about a model in medicine that's built on what's right and good about each person uh, rather than just what's missing or what's wrong. And this is going to create a new era of healing and well-being. Um, and it's really about the democratization of medicine, um, which is, as we know, uh, the democratization of the world and human rights is spreading everywhere very slowly. And even in our major institutions, that is a day that's coming. We will talk then about the four pillars of healing and well-being uh, that have come up over and over with these people that I study. And you can think about how these apply to you. People who have fallen off the cliff and whisking them off to the emergency room or to the clinic and helping to heal not so good at is putting a guardrail at the top so that people don't fall off the cliff in the first place. What I have learned is that the people I study use the factors of healing well-being to construct a ladder that took them back up that cliff. They applied these factors very intensely, but these same factors are also the guardrails that keep a person from falling off the cliff in the first place in many instances. Not in all, but in many. 90% of the major killers in the UK, in Europe, and in the United States, and around the world are lifestyle related. And yet that's not the kind of medicine that we practice or uh, even are aware of many times. So I'm very interested in helping to create those guardrails of health, healing, and well being. As we have been saying, the uh, the state of modern medicine is such that uh, it's brilliant for those people who have fallen off the cliff. Nearly one in two Americans, and these are pretty similar statistics for uh, the UK and Britain, UK and Europe as well. 45% have a chronic condition such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and asthma. These conditions have created an international healthcare crisis and are crippling our current healthcare systems. We have a a system of sick care, but we don't really have a health care system. We don't even study health. We don't have a science of health. We study diseases and medications. We just now are beginning to study health and well-being, and that's a completely radically new development and is promising great things. More than two-thirds of all deaths are caused by one or more of five chronic diseases. And by that, I mean heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic lung disease, and diabetes. These are the top global causes of death and disability and account for 75% of all healthcare spending. Uh, the increased prevalence of these diseases uh, has caused two thirds of the increase in recent years in healthcare spending. The World Health Organization has also named depression as the number one health problem around the world because of its high association with, with morbidity, with illness and death and uh, decreased work productivity, et cetera. So Western medicine is in crisis on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, many other illnesses exist outside of these common chronic ailments. These cause significant suffering and disability. As we already have said, 90% of the major killers are lifestyle illnesses in general. We desperately need an approach that does not just tinker at the edges of traditional ways of thinking, but help us think in radically new ways about health and well-being. One of the brilliant things about Western medicine is that 
Uh, we are very good at focusing on parts. Um, doctors specialize in the part of the body they're interested in. If you're a cardiologist, you study the heart. If you're a psychiatrist, you study the brain. If you're a gastroenterologist, you're interested in the gastrointestinal system. But, and that creates uh, really important information and gives us lots of very knowledgeable experts. But if those experts don't take a second step and stand back and look at the forest for the trees and see the role that stress is playing in a person's life or understand the story of a person's life and how that relates to the illness, then you're not getting the whole story of what you need to heal. We also send a medical problem to the physician. We send a psychological problem to the psychotherapist. We send a spiritual problem to the priest, rabbi, minister, or imam, and you get specialized information, but we aren't helped to see typically the ways in which all these different aspects of our being interact and the way they can be used to a whole different level to create health and well-being in our lives. I, for example, I took care of a person who came into the emergency room uh, not that long ago with chest pain. She was a 64-year-old woman, a lovely lady. She came with chest pain. She was admitted for two days for a cardiac workup. Um, cardiac workup was negative, so they had me see her. And uh, I just simply asked her, so what's been stressful in your life recently? Well, it turns out the day before she came to the emergency room, her husband, who she had been with since age 15, uh, the only man she'd ever known in her life and had ever dated, um, had packed up his bags and told her that he was leaving for Florida and was done with their marriage. She had never slept alone in her life. She had never lived alone. She had never not been in a relationship with him since age 15, and she was devastated. She uh, came into the emergency room with chest pain, had a rule out negative in terms of a chest a heart problem, and I wanted her to see somebody to help her deal with her stress. She refused. She said she's an old school Catholic, didn't believe in that sort of thing. A month later, she's back in the emergency room, and this time with chest pain, but uh, now with atrial fibrillation. And that's a dangerous heart rhythm. She will be on medications for the rest of her life unless she changes her lifestyle significantly. Uh, these are medications with significant side effects and difficult to live with because of all the blood levels and how dangerous they are and how they interact with so many medications and the risk of stroke and all kinds of things. So I can't prove that her atrial fibrillation was caused by her stress and the loss of her marriage. But I see this kind of thing over and over again. I see people, there's a woman I know who is admitted to the hospital after arguments with her mother. She has these thrombophlebitic attacks. And all I have to do is say, so you had another argument with your mother, right? And so the, the relationship of stress to what eventuates in our physical bodies is significant and largely ignored. I tell the story of June in, our, in, in Cured. Uh, it's a wonderful story. I tell a lot of stories in Cured. But I like to tell her story because it's a love story between a man and a woman and about what becomes possible. She was diagnosed in her early 20s with an autoimmune illness called ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, it's um, basically an illness there is no cure for, especially more than 30 years ago when she had this. Uh, basically, she was told that her body was going to become a concrete block that she wouldn't be able to move. Her bones were going to calcify in a way that she couldn't move the bones of her uh, spine, the, the, the bones in her pelvic area, et cetera. And the calcifications just start in the pelvic region and go up your spine. And um, they basically cement you into a frozen posture. She was devastated. She loved her husband. She wanted to have children. She had a lot of dreams. And this is a story about the power of nutrition and the power of learning to change your relationship with stress. And that's what she learned to do. Uh, over 30 years ago, uh, there was a very different world in terms of yoga groups. She was raised in New York and in a very traditional and loving family. Certainly had not ever considered something like yoga, especially in those days. She started with yoga and that became the doorway into changing her nutrition and changing her relationship with herself. And she is not in a movable concrete mass. I can assure you she's the most flexible person I've ever met. She is one of the most lively, loving, and um, uh, happy people I know. 
and has an amazing story. Um, and uh, there has been actually several spontaneous remissions in their family that we don't have time to get into of very different diseases, but she led the way and her husband also was a huge support for her and always has been and uh, has integrated these into uh, these factors into his life as well. And so have um, at least some of their children. And it's just an amazing story. Uh, but she has been completely disease free now for well over 30 years and shares her time between San Diego and New York, uh, seeing her grandkids and did end up having the life that she really wanted. I wish we could go more deeply into the factors of what it really means to change your uh, nutrition and stress level. And we'll get to that in a few minutes, but you have to go more deeply and cure to see that. Now, this story I don't tell in the book, but I tell it to you because this is one of your own. This is Stephen Hawking. And yeah, I know he's from uh, Cambridge and spent his life in um, Great Britain and is one of the real lights uh, that has come out in recent years. And so I, I thought you might be interested in his story. We'll tell it briefly. Uh, he was diagnosed with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is ALS. He was diagnosed with this uh, at age 22, I believe, and told that he would be dead within two years. And he died 55 years later at age 76. I think he died in February last year, I believe. My um, literary agent, uh, Doug Abrams, uh, knew him and was working on a book with him at the time when he died and talked about the intensity of his eyes and just how alive, how his eyes sparkled, how alive he was in a frozen body. And so he didn't have a recovery, but he long outlasted his prognosis. And I think these stories are just as important. Stephen Hawking said that he attributed his longevity to a sense of humor and keeping his mind active. Certainly, we know that he did keep his mind active. Um, and I'll tell you a funny little story just to show the kind of wit that he had. He was on HBO's uh, John Oliver, a show with John Oliver once. And, um, and John Oliver, they're talking about parallel universes. And uh, John Oliver said, so there, is there a parallel universe where I'm smarter than you? And Stephen Hawking said, yes, and also one where you are funny. So that got a laugh, of course, from the audience. And then uh, they continued to talk about parallel universes. And John Oliver said, so is there a parallel universe where my alter ego is dating actress Charlize Theron? And uh, quick as a wit, uh, the attribution was that uh, Stephen Hawking indicated that that was beyond the bounds of scientific possibility. So a very funny guy. There's a lot of other stories. Um, if we had more time, we would go into them. Uh, he loved adventure. He was an intrepid explorer. He ended up going into space and circling in sub-zero gravity nine times, did not want to come down. The drama around all of that associated with uh, Peter Diamandis at Singularity University is truly astonishing and heart touching. Uh, the number of insurance policies they had to get for all the doctors, and it was a, it's a truly a great story. But he was an intrepid explorer with a great sense of humor and an active mind. So there's lots of stories we could talk about today. Um, these stories are talked, most of these are talked about in um, Cured. Dr. Patricia Kane, a physician diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There is no recovery from that. Your lungs turn to cardboard and you die. Uh, diagnosed by biopsy. She was so grateful for her illness after her recovery that she then went back and started doing home visits for years with patients who were so sick they couldn't leave the home. This is her way of um, making a return out of gratitude for the way the illness changed her relationship with herself. Um, she also started an uh, email called Doc's Daily Chuckle and sends out these e emails um, just saying that humor is really important for um, making one's path different in dealing with an illness. Claire, we've talked briefly about with pancreatic cancer. Her website is livingwithpancreaticcancer.com. Pablo from London, diagnosed by biopsy with glioblastoma multiform, which is uh, the worst form of brain cancer, now is recovered and uh, has a child, which he was told would be impossible. Uh, Jerry White, renal cell carcinoma, Tom Wood, type two diabetes and chronic pain. Now he does not technically have an incurable illness, but I thought it was important to tell his story anyway, because diabetes is one of the most common illnesses in the Western world and around the world in general. 
and yet we treat it as an incurable illness, even though it's not. It's a lifestyle illness most of the time. And um, I thought it's just important to show the power of what happens when you change your lifestyle and nutrition. Mira Benel has a fabulous story. She was just on the Dr. Oz show with us with metastatic melanoma, treated by one of the real um, research gurus around metastatic melanoma, very well diagnosed. Um, Mary Munsell, bipolar disorder. She doesn't have lab tests to show, but I tell her story, not in the book, but in these kinds of talks, because people also need to know that there is recovery from psychiatric illnesses like bipolar disorder. And she has started a um, a peer-to-peer -peer organization uh, that um, she fills a ballroom every year. And I, and I often give the keynote address to help people uh, recover from or vastly improve their quality of life with their illness. So let's talk now. Uh, we have 10 minutes left uh, before we go to questions and answers. Let's talk about the four pillars of, of recovery, the four pillars of healing and well-being. The first is nutrition. And that's a big one. The second one is healing your immune system. The third is healing your relationship with stress. And the fourth one is healing your identity and your false beliefs. So let's begin with nutrition. Uh, again, if you want to go more deeply into Claire's website, it's a good general human discussion about a lot of these issues. Uh, she did what so many of these people who I studied did. She eliminated processed foods and chemicals. She eliminated sugar, refined flours, and for the most part, animal products. Uh, some people who I've studied did this 100%. Others did it most of the way, but they still would give themselves, um, if, you know, if they had cheese they particularly liked or cake once in a while, and that sort of thing. But they still made major changes. Some were uh, more uh, thoroughgoing than others. I think the main point is if you make significant changes, you're going to change the biochemistry of your body. And sometimes what happens is that makes a body less hospitable to disease. This is a really big topic. I wish we had more time for it today. Um, you know, let me just say this. Over 100 years ago, uh, the average person ate two pounds of sugar per year on average. Now, the average person eats closer to 152 pounds of sugar per year. We just simply are not aware, most of us, how far off the mark uh, we are in terms of what our bodies have been designed to handle. Our bodies just simply are not built to handle that kind of load, and sugar is highly inflammatory. The same is true for refined flours, the enriched flours. They're just so um, reduced in terms of genuine nutrition that they are highly inflammatory for the body. 88% of survivors converted to the vegetarian diet. I purposely told the story and cured of people who um, did not go just with plant-based, um, but because um, I, I think it's a big topic, but underneath all the superficial differences in the dietary changes that people made that I've studied, the common differences were they eliminated most of the sugar, eliminated most of the processed foods, and began eating plant-based whole foods. I just had a talk a few hours ago with the person, um, Dr. Colin Campbell at Cornell. He played a major role in coining the terms plant-based whole foods because he did not want to be identified just as a vegan or a vegetarian with all the uh, ways that's often understood. He just wanted people to eat healthy foods. And he uh, told me, uh, he, sent, he sent me the papers, which I'll have to read later uh, this week about the rapid changes. Uh, he was studying the uh, hepatitis B virus, which of course the study in viruses is very important right now with the whole coronavirus thing. And he said people that changed quickly from an animal-based diet to plant-based, their antibody production shot up very rapidly uh, within a day or two. And he was shocked by how rapidly that changed. Um, and so he sent me the scientific research he's done on that. I'll be very interested to look at that carefully and see what um, his findings were. That was with a different virus, but still that kind of research is important for us to understand. I think we have spent many years depleting our immune systems because of the approach that we currently have, and we need to start firing up 
the superpowers of our brilliant immune cells so they can not be sluggish any longer, but work crisply and efficiently. Uh, I should also say that uh, I have seen people make changes in nutrition because of fear. That's not going to be as effective. But if you are focusing on putting nutrition in your body and not focus so much on what you're giving up, it changes the psychology of this significantly. And it changes it physiologically probably as well. The second pillar, healing your immune system. Let me just say this. You don't have a heart problem, a diabetes problem, a cancer problem, an autoimmune problem. More fundamentally, you have a chronic inflammation problem. And if you want to lower the inflammation in your body, then you need to heal your immune system. You have a brilliant immune system. We currently tend to nuke the germ, nuke the microbe, whether it's bacteria or um, the viruses or whatever, and we think that's what takes care of it. And that's not what works. Microbes are not attracted to a healthy body. Viruses and bacteria can only take root in a system that is already unhealthy in some ways. We all have good bacteria, bad bacteria, good viruses, bad viruses in us. And it's not a good approach to just nuke the good and bad microbes away, thinking that's going to take care of it. Because if you're killing the, the good with the bad, then you're weakening your immune system in a massive way. Claude Bernard argued with Louis Pasteur. He drank a glass of cholera in front of his classroom to make a point. He did not get sick because he knew how to take care of what we now call the microbiome. Louis Pasteur, when he died, he said Bernard was right. He said on his deathbed, Bernard was right. The terrain is everything. The terrain is the microbiome. Um, and if you don't know much about the microbiome, I strongly encourage you to educate yourself on that. It can change your whole understanding of how to create a robust, strong immune system. So let me hurry through this so that we can get to the last um, uh, pillar of healing and well-being, the last two pillars. The third pillar is you need to heal your relationship with stress. Now, let me say that not all stress is bad. We all need challenge stress to help us grow and learn. Running a marathon, for example, can be challenge stress if it helps you reach your higher self and expand your understanding of what you're capable of. But if you're in a toxic relationship, or if you finish work every day depleted and questioning your value, then something needs to change because you're going to be in chronic fight or flight and you're not going to be able to heal properly. In that kind of situation, you need to either change your environment or change your relationship with your environment. You need to be out of fight or flight and into a state characterized by the release of oxytocin, the love molecule, dopamine, the pleasure pathway, serotonin, the feel-good molecule. You need to activate your vagus nerve, and that creates a very different physiology that your immune system loves. And instead of being sluggish and making mistakes, your immune system fires up and becomes accurate, crisp, and efficient. The fourth pillar is the healing of identity and beliefs. Now, what does it mean to heal your identity and beliefs? Some of the people I've studied had such a deep change in their identity that they would change their names. Other people would walk down a street that they had lived in their entire lives and they wouldn't be recognized because they had changed so significantly at such a deep level. So what does it mean to heal your identity? It means that you focus on what's right and good about you and you eliminate false beliefs that cause you to question your value. Um, one of the most common things that people have said to me over the years is that it took an illness for them to wake up and realize that they had spent their entire lives taking care of others or responding to the perceived expectations of others, and they, did, they needed to stop doing that. They needed to focus on what creates life and well-being within them, what causes you to come alive, what puts a light in your eyes and helps you know your value and your purpose. It might seem selfish to set up this new kind of life for yourself, but I promise you it's not. And you may be astonished at the results. It will absolutely change your relationships with others and your relationship with yourself. And as my friend Gabor Mate says, he says, if you don't know how to say no, your body will eventually say no for you. And that's where a significant amount of illness comes from. In my experience, I see people 
in both a medical and psychiatric hospital every day. And I'm telling you, if you don't know how to say no, your body will eventually say no for you. So focus on what's right and good about you. Eliminate false beliefs that cause you to question your value. Every person brings something magnificent and good into the world. And this is not an abstraction, but needs to be practically integrated into your life. So, I think it's also important to understand that we make interpretations about the events that we suffer. Uh, there's a lot of trauma in the world. Um, and two people can be sitting in Hyde Park next to each other on a park bench, and they can be literally living in two different universes. One person will look out and see fearful things and things that cause them to feel more afraid or unvalued. Another person right next to him or her can see the same events but interpret them differently. And they also will focus on different events. They'll focus, they'll see a mother pushing a baby carriage or a couple talking lovingly to each other. And they'll, they'll pick out different things in the environment and they will interpret things in the environment differently as well. So, I don't know how many of you have seen this before. Do you see an old woman or do you see a young woman? It depends on what you focus on. If you see an old woman, then look at her eye until it becomes an ear and you will see a young woman. If you see a young woman, then look at her ear until it becomes an eye. Every one of us makes decisions about what we focus on and we make interpretations data and it's not just about the facts, it's about the interpretation that we, that we apply. If a person interprets their situation that all hope is lost, they can end up committing suicide if it's a really awful circumstance. Another person can believe that love is stronger than fear and hate and uses that opportunity to discover a bottomless reservoir within the human spirit and their health trajectory their life goes in a completely different direction. And we could talk a lot about that, but uh, that's all the time we have for that today. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that this is a, an exciting time. We are going to see a rapid democratization of health as technology now begins to help drive those changes. We are going to start focusing on health and well-being, and not just on diseases and medications. That's very exciting and I think it's unethical to give false hope, but I also believe it's unethical uh, to not provide grounded ethical hope built on solid medical evidence for people about the kinds of possibilities that exist. So I'm gonna stop the slide presentation now, and I would like to take any questions that you have. Um, uh, if there's any anything you wanna talk about, um, uh, there's a question here. Could you please explain quantum healing? Well, that is a massive question. <laughs> Actually, in Cured, I have a friend who is the uh, head of a physics department uh, division at MIT, uh, and he's a physicist, a massive, uh, brilliant researcher, uh, Andreas Merchan. And uh, I've asked him, we had a short um, interaction in the book where it's a question and answer sort of thing where he I, uh, he explains some of the experiments in quantum physics. And because physicists are often unhappy with the way the general public and writers talk about quantum physics or quantum healing. And so my contention is, well, then the physicists need to be talking about this stuff to the general public so that we are using these words in a manner that's consistent with physics, um, with the, the hardcore scientists. And so it's a really big topic. I think quantum physics has been around for 80 years, but we still live in a Newtonian world, in a, in a world characterized by um, Newtonian physics, especially in medicine yet. That's beginning to change. But, you know, quantum physicists, it's a baffling world. Um, there's physicists who will just simply tell you the material world doesn't exist. It does not exist. It does not exist in it's at least in the way we think it does. So uh, that's a mind-boggling statement. And um, so there's a case in Cured where I talk about that because of it's very relevant to a person uh, who had a healing after he went into an MRI machine. And it, an MRI is all about, it's built on the physics, principles of quantum physics. And so uh, great, great question. Um, 
wish we had more time to go into all of that today. And let me look at some of these other questions here. Um, what kind of recovery process could be followed for sciatica? Could this be healed by changing nutrition and lifestyle? Yes, I had, I had a back problem myself um, for many years. I tell this story in Cured actually, um, and I won't go into it very deeply um, because of time limitations, but um, uh, there's a physician friend of mine. Uh, he's also a healer. He's trained as a surgeon in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, but also is a healer. And uh, I was interviewing some of his patients, so this is years ago now, probably maybe six years ago or more. It's actually, it's longer than that, I think. Um, but I had this chronic back problem probably from the years I grew up on a farm and carried things that were far too heavy. And uh, especially when I was stressed, it was just really painful. I never told him this. And, um, and he... I was doing, I was, you know, interviewing these patients, and he said to me, he said, he turned to me, he said, you've got a back problem, get on my table here, and I did, and for about 30 seconds, he did something, and it was, I don't know how to talk about it, except that uh, he, it's like my back momentarily, my experience is that my back momentarily became kind of rubbery, he pushed something into place and said, you're fine. And he changed the shape of my back. I've never had a back problem since. And that's been years now. So yes, there are mysteries that I don't fully understand at all yet. Um, there's a question here about evidence for Parkinson's. Parkinson's is, uh, the evidence is showing that that is a more and more uh, understood to be a lifestyle disease. And certainly I tell my patients um, that you've got to follow these four factors so that you don't end up with old age diseases that we think are aging and they're not. They're just uh, the result of years of not knowing how to take care of the mind and the body. And then we call these aging and it's not. So that's a great question. Um, uh, let's see, so many questions here. Um, there's a question about should you stop your immune, stop the medication for your immune system? You know, these medications, um, I don't know which medication is being talked about here by this person, um, but I think it's important to understand that I'm not against medications. I'm against the overuse of medications, and I'm against the use of medications in place of making the deep changes in one life, in one's life that creates health and well-being. Um, medications are powerful. I see them change lives every day. I use medications both um, in my work at a psychiatric hospital and at a medical hospital. Uh, but they're not silver bullets, and they're not near the silver bullets that we often teach them as being. Um, I think medications treat symptoms and not causes. I do believe, and there are some medicines that are clearly, uh, they are immune suppressants. You know, it's fascinating to me that we use medications to lower fevers. Now, I, I do believe that people, we don't want to have people with dangerous fevers, but animals, when they have a fever, they move to a warmer spot so that they even more unleash the superpowers of their immune system. And it's a big topic I talk about here around fevers and how to power up the immune system. The immune system takes more, takes care of more than infections. The immune system is what you have to heal if you want to get rid of cancer or prevent cancer or heart disease or depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder or um, heart disease autoimmune illness. And so we need to really rethink how we work with the immune system. Uh, practical advice can we give to a senior family member as an alternative considering a highly risky back surgery? Great question. Western medicine is does not have a great track record with the back. Um, I tell several stories in Cured along these lines. Um, and yes, I have seen surgery for the back be very effective, and I've seen many surgeries be less than effective or not effective at all. Um, uh, I got a question here. What's your view on fasting? I think fasting is fabulous. One has to understand it's best done under the care of a medical professional because there are places you can get into danger, especially with certain medical conditions. Uh, you don't want to worsen your situation, but I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting or different kinds of fasting as a way of clearing toxins out of the body and 
becoming less defined by the physical and more defined by a deeper part of uh, deep within us. Um, and when you clear out toxins, great things can happen. Uh, autoimmune disorders, there's a lot of questions here about uh, autoimmune conditions. Um, there, I talk a lot about autoimmune and cured, but there's also a great book uh, that came out by Palmer Kippola that's specifically about autoimmune disorders. And it's a brilliant book. It's a short read, but covers many of these same factors, um, focuses mostly on nutrition and changing your stress response. And she had herself had MS, uh, multiple sclerosis, and you know went and saw doctors for many, many years, and then was shocked when she began to change her lifestyle uh, to recover completely. And it's an important story to look at. There's a number of stories um, about multiple sclerosis, about MS that are important to look at. I was going to tell uh, one of the stories I have in my files about multiple sclerosis, but just didn't have time in the book to do so. Probably should have because it's such a devastating illness for so many people. Um, what's the most powerful thing we can do for ourselves? The most powerful thing is the biggest thing, and that is, I believe, to heal your identity so that you really understand your value. All of us are born with a set of beliefs that we inherit from our parents and from teachers, from kids on the playground, from colleagues at work. Some of these beliefs are false and some of them are true. And for the most part, we live with these beliefs and they're unexamined. It's my firm belief that if you are giving your mind and body mixed, um, mixed messages, because you have not examined and healed your beliefs, then you're going to have mixed results in your body and in your life and in your mind. And so I think that's a big one. Um, is there any evidence that the four pillars work with addiction? Yes, I talk about this in Cured. Uh, addiction. Addiction is more than just to alcohol or drugs. And many of us live with addiction. Um, whether, I mean, diabetes can be understood as a is a disease of addiction. Heart disease can be understood as a disease, disease of addiction. And if you want to help a person with diabetes or with an alcohol problem or a drug problem or with a heart problem, then you help them more not by telling them, uh, not by focusing on the disease, but by helping them get a life where they know their value and their purpose. And they come alive with a life where they're not responding to the perceived expectations of others, but instead waking up to their own authentic life. And when you do that, um, you don't need the addiction the same way. I can tell you story after story around this kind of thing um, and what it means to close the door in the back of your mind that most people close partially, but they kind of know unconscious, sub subconsciously that when the stress gets high, they can just go back to that food or that alcohol or that um, drug or that behavior just for one night when they're feeling really stressed. But then, of course, that just keeps them that, that same loop going. So knowing how to burn that boat in a way that it's no longer an option um, opens a different doorway in your life. Uh, and I have a chapter on that called Burn Your Boat and Cured. So uh, I wonder what else. There's so many questions here. Um, uh, tell the name of the book on the autoimmune condition. That is um, Palmer Kippola's uh, Heal, uh, it's called Beat Autoimmune, I believe. P-A-L-M-E-R, Palmer Kippola. Uh, last name is spelled K-I-P-P-O-L-A. Beat Autoimmune is the name of the book. It's a thin book. It's got great information, very consistent with the kinds of things we're talking about here. Um, there's a question here about vaccines. I think that's a really big topic. Um, I, I'm not a vaccine expert. I'm not an immunologist. Um, what I do personally is I get vaccines, but I always tell the nurse, shake that vial because I don't want any of that mercury. I don't want to, since the mercury settles out, I don't want to uh, get a massive injection of mercury. I want just a small part of that. And um, I think vaccines are important can be life-saving, they have their risks. I also think they're not silver bullets. And you can look at the flu vaccine as a way to go into that more deeply. Um, what else here? There's a lot of questions. Um, there's a question here about replaying this and 
hearing it, yes, I believe that's going to be available um, as an option. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, this is going to be available for replay and relisting, I believe. How can we help someone else start implementing the protocol you talk about? That's a great question. And this is what I tell people. Whatever thing, whatever decision a person makes, say that you have a loved one who's very ill with a lifestyle disease, there's nothing in us that responds to judgment or cajoling or going down a pathway that we're not ready for. Um, I think that this needs to be whatever, whether a person chooses, for example, let's take a cancer patient who has to make a decision around getting an immune suppressant and uh, medications, um, and they're trying to decide what to do. The person needs to follow the path that feels liberating and right for them. And I can tell you, the, the path that feels right to one person is not the path that will feel right to the next person. And we can't impose these things. We have to help a person find the path that makes sense to them based upon their own deep wishes and longings. Uh, there's some, there's a lot of uh, things around this, but I'm not into judging people. I'm interested in helping people find the path that uh, is most life-giving for them. And I think that belief is a big thing. If you believe in something, that's a whole big topic in itself that um, is talked about and cured. Uh, but um, what you believe in is worth paying attention to as well. The, the placebo response is built around that, where people get better for taking sugar pills. And people, you can tell a person in a placebo experiment that you're giving them a sugar pill and they can still get better. And so there are unconscious things around this, maybe with the way we believe that somebody in a white coat, if they're giving you a pill, that's probably good for you and your unconscious response to that. Maybe that's partly what's going on here. Uh, but again, helping a person clarify for themselves a path that is feels liberating and life-giving to them is really important. Um, can this approach help with personality disorders? Um, yes, uh, but we're also talking about something complicated here. Personality disorders are basically usually trauma responses that have become hardened, correct? And so I think it's helpful to understand that the personality disorder is the superficial diagnosis, but the deeper, truer diagnosis is that there is usually a history of trauma and helping a person know their value, know that they're not defective at some level, that they have value, um, and begin to find a path that feels life-giving life -giving in that sense where they feel seen and heard is um, a place to start. But that's a big topic. That's a great question. Is it too late for someone in their 70s? No. I purposely tell the story, stories and cured about people who were elderly when they had their diagnoses. Uh, one example, for example, is uh, uh, the uh, story about diabetes I told, um, mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, he so he was, you know, an Ivy League graduate, very bright guy, was an athlete when he was young, a CEO of a company, and very successful, but had been diagnosed with diabetes for many years. And he prided himself on not just seeing the best doctors for diabetes, but seeing the best endocrinologists who were so specialized that they only treated diabetes. And he saw these doctors for over 20 years, was shocked that when he changed his diet that his diabetes went away. And now in his uh, mid seventies, I believe he is now uh, feels better than he felt many years ago. He believes he's physiologically younger than he was 20 years ago. And he probably is according to the uh, indices. And it used to be that he could only walk a matter of feet without being doubled over in pain. Now he walks three miles every day, uh, no pain at all, feels vital and energetic and um, no diabetes and no back pain. And so that's um, one brief answer to that. Uh, thoughts on finding a vaccine for COVID-19. I know that there's a lot of investigation on that. I think the vaccine is quite a ways away, um, but there's a lot of energy going into it. Again, vaccines can be critically important, but they're not silver bullets. Um, we know that with a flu vaccine, that flu is a virus and, um, there's a lot of reasons why vaccines for some illnesses are completely curative and why they're uh, much less curative for other illnesses. And we simply don't know enough about COVID-19 um, in terms of 
or once you have antibodies, does that mean you can't catch it again? There's so many unknowns with COVID-19 that we just don't know yet. Uh, any comments on how to help fibromyalgia? Absolutely, I would look at, I mean, fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease and look at um, Palmer Kippola's book on beat autoimmune. Um, uh, certainly there's some things in my book that talk about that, but I don't talk about fibromyalgia directly, but I, I believe that Palmer Kippola's book does. Um, uh, let's see. You know, there's a question here about if this is um, about white privilege. I think that's a great thing that is important to talk about. I purposely tell the stories in Cured, some people who had no resources. Uh, some people in my book and in, then in Cured did have resources. They could afford yoga classes. They could afford uh, major changes with their nutrition. But I purposely tell the story of people who didn't have any of these things, that didn't even have a job, that couldn't even pay their mortgage. And they still found a way to make deep changes. And these changes, we often have misunderstandings. We think nutrition has to be really expensive, for example. Well, that's actually not always the case. Um, there's ways to get great nutrition, but not have a vastly uh, more expensive uh, diet. Um, some people are not gonna be able to afford uh, expensive treatments. And I think that, um, I don't think things happen for an accident. I think that there are ways to figure out a path for each of us that's uniquely ta tailored to us, but it takes looking at our individual situations. There's a question here about if a person has cancer, is it their fault? No, it's not. It's not at all, I think. Um, I think what's true is, as doctors, we have the same illnesses. We don't know how, since we haven't studied how people heal, we don't know how to heal ourselves. And I think that's a sad statement, but I think it's true. I think it's a lot, I'm not, I don't want to be um, in a situation where victims are being blamed. I think when we know better, we do better. I think when we have more accurate knowledge, we can make different choices, but it doesn't mean that we weren't doing the best that we knew before. Um, I think we all do the best we can with what we know. And I think more accurate knowledge helps, but it's not just about the individual, it's about a culture that doesn't study um, these factors. Uh, we don't have really good um, uh, objective nutrition research for the most part. Doctors are not taught nutrition. Um, even nutritionists are often not taught um, genuine nutrition. It's, it's a, we're talking about a big problem in the culture. And so of course, many of us don't have the information that we need because it's not available to a lot of us. So uh, let's see what other questions are here. Uh, the polyvagal theory, great theory. I talk a lot about the how to activate your vagal nerve. Uh, it, it, that gets you out of chronic fight or flight. The vagal nerve is this big super highway of relaxation and connection with yourself and with others. It goes through the middle of your body and is connected to most of the organs in your body. And it takes you out of fight or flight and into a very different neurochemistry where your body is secreting oxytocin, the love molecule, secreting dopamine, the pleasure pathway, uh, serotonin, the, the happy molecule, we could call it. And it's a very different kind of physiology for your body. And so to know how to activate the vagal nerve and, you know, the polyvagal theory is a great theory. Uh, you can type that into Google and read a lot about it. It talks about the evolution of the systems within us. I think uh, I was shocked to learn that, you know, we, we're taught in school maybe that, um, that Darwin taught us that survival of the fittest is important. And what's true is uh, in, the, in his book, The Descent of Man, he talks about the survival of the fittest. I think it's two times mentions that and 95 times mentions love. And that's a very different physiology. And it's more, he uh, talks and what we are now learning in more recent years is that our ability to connect with each other, to cooperate with each other is much, confers a much higher survival advantage than competing with each other and being in fight or flight because we're just trying to be the best. It doesn't work that way. And the polyvagal theory is a very sophisticated piece of research that looks into relearning how to train our stress response. So that's a very sophisticated question. I appreciate that. 
Um, what sparked your initial interest in studying and researching this interesting topic of healing and well-being? I talked a little bit about Nikki, the oncology nurse at Mass General, how she got me started on this. And I was initially skeptical and resistant, but um, I'm so grateful to her for having um, been persistent in having these people send me their stories and medical um, lab tests and that sort of thing. So, you know, of course, on all of our minds is the COVID thing. Um, I think, you know, we're in this bizarre situation where we are told to isolate from each other. We are told, um, we see on the news, you know, that we know from research that 10 times more bad news is reported um, than good news. Um, the mantra is, um, if it leads, if it bleeds, it leads. And our, and it's, our brains are wired to see a uh, threat on the horizon. If you are driving along the road uh, and you see a car accident, do you look at the car accident or is your, or are you looking at the beautiful mountains scenery behind it? We are physiologically wired to, uh, to see fearful things, but we need to cultivate the capacity to balance that out with also imagining the best case scenarios and not just worst case scenarios um, by uh, choosing what to focus on, choosing to see what is a risk, but also balancing that with what's the opportunity and knowing that there is something deeply good and benevolent about what each person brings into the world, that the universe is friendly and that we can um, not just live from a place of fear. Now we are approaching the end of our time. And so um, I wish we could go on, but I think we need to um, begin wrapping up. I wanna say that it's just been a real pleasure to speak with you today. It's an honor to do so. Um, these are great questions and there's just so many questions here that I can't uh, respond to right now. Hypertension, questions about that. Hypertension is absolutely a lifestyle disease. If you wanna look at a book on that, I would say look at The End of Heart Disease by Joel Furman, F-U-H-R-M-A-N, The End of Heart Disease. He talks a lot about how to heal hypertension. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap up. I think Dana is working in the technology aspect of this. Um, so again, it's a real honor to be with you today. And I hope to return at some point and uh, go more deeply into these things. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye and hope you all can stay well during these strange times. I would, uh, like I said earlier, I mentioned Colin Campbell's uh, comments he was making to me earlier today. He was talking about the research he did in viruses. He's the person who coined the words whole foods and plant-based. And he was shocked. This was animal research and it's not human research yet. And so I'll see what his articles say that he just sent to me before this talk started. But he was shocked at how rapidly within a day or two the antibody production shot up uh, when people switched from um, unhealthy foods to a plant-based whole, whole food diet. When your body's getting the nutrition it needs, um, it responds very well. So thank you all. I wish I could see you in person. Thank you for these great questions. Until next time, please take care and stay healthy.